So, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming to our session, Implementing Event Sourcing Strategy on Azure. And Olena, can you tell a bit about what we are going to talk about today? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, obviously, about <laughs> event sourcing. Um, yeah, so this session, the idea for this session came to, to us when uh, I was working in a product company and I was starting working with um, Cosmos DB, Azure Cosmos DB, and uh, I was sharing with Eldad many times like how, how cool, how many features there are. And uh, Eldad proposed to let's create a session around it. And uh, in our opinion, um, Cosmos DB had, was a really good fit for event sourcing strategies. So that's why we pulled the session around it and we want to share it today how to actually implement it all together on Asia. Uh, yeah, and once again, my name is Solana Borzanko. I'm working second day in a company called <laughs> Xperit. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Feel free to reach out, leave common feedback. Uh, I'm always happy for, for any, <laughs> any kind of communication. So. so thank you. And so I'm El Trotebourg. Uh, I come from the Netherlands. I work at a company called Motion 10. We focus on everything Microsoft, but myself, I mostly focus on Azure and integration. I'm also an F Azure MVP, so I love doing these kind of talks. I do a lot of speaking, blogging, writing. Basically, anything I can do with the community, I try to do. So thank you for having me here today. And same for me. If you have any questions, any remarks, please let me know. I'm always available on my social media, so definitely reach out there. And with that, let's go to a quick introduction on event sourcing. So but today we are going to focus mostly on how can we implement event sourcing on Azure, not so much on event sourcing itself, uh, but I do want to give a quick introduction just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, like, okay, if we talk about event sourcing, what are we actually talking about? So I grabbed this nice picture from the Microsoft Docs uh, page, <laughs> um, and this kind of explains, okay, so what is event sourcing? And uh, on just one second, let me just make sure that I'm plugged in before my battery dies. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so event sourcing, as the name suggests, is all about events. And so what you can see, um, oh, not that one, uh, this one. So what you can see here, basically from your pre presentation layer, so from your application, you're going to create events. And so events can be something like, okay, I created a cart, uh, I added an item, I added another item. And these are all events with some information about how do you want to change the state of your entity. So in this case, you have an uh, entity that is a shopping basket, and we are changing, changing the state of the entity by creating it, adding articles to it, uh, removing articles, adding shipping information. And we all store this in this event stored over here, which we will see later on is implemented with us on Cosmos DB. But before we go to that, let's also focus a little bit on this, because we also will be focusing on this part. So what we are going to show you today as well is how can you ma create a materialized view on top of those events. And materialized view is basically, okay, you want to display the information in some way, which we'll talk about more later. You can also have systems and applications that just read those events directly, so without materialized view. In this case, they just replay those events. And by replaying those events, by, uh, you can eventually get the final state of that entity. So in this case, we would have a sh uh, shopping cart with one item in there uh, and some shipping info. Uh, and of course, you can also replay those events in any way that you want. So anyone can just basically come to our event store and say, hey, I want to get the current state of this particular uh, order. Please give it to me. They get all the events, they play it back, and that way they can get us. So like I said, not a deep dive on event sourcing, but definitely like a quick introduction. So okay, what's event sourcing? So it's all about events, and those events you store. You don't store the entity itself, you store those events. And by storing those events and playing them back, you can get the current state of that entity. So why should we use event sourcing? And for that, first let's have a look at CRUD. Because I think everyone here at some point built a CRUD application, uh, you create some data, you create an entity, you store it into a database, uh, you update it, you may delete some parts of it, but basically you're working with this singular entity in a database. Now this is fine and dandy as long as your application uh, is not that large. You can also do it a lot with large applications, by the way, I'm not saying this is not possible, but it gets harder. And why does it get harder when we start doing like millions of producers and stuff like that? Because you start locking your data. Because when you're working with a database, uh, if an entity is being changed, you don't want another uh, producer to work on the same entity because they might be overriding the same fields uh, or they might be reading data that's out, of, uh, that's out of sync. So you have to lock that data, make sure no one can actually adjust the data except for that one producer. And then, like I said, this is fine if you're working with like thousands of uh, producers, but once you get into like millions of producers, this does become a hassle. 
Also, concurrency is quite difficult when you work with like those kind of high traffic, high throughput uh, applications. Because um, uh, one uh, producer is inserting something, another producer is reading that data, um, and they might get with an obsolete state because someone else already updated it. And so this concurrency is quite hard when you do this with the normal CRUD. So the main problem is that CRUD is not easily scalable. Like once again, I'm not saying it's not scalable. Of course, you can do this, but it takes a lot of effort. Where event sourcing will, as we see in a moment, will solve a lot of these issues for us. Finally, uh, something that always annoyed me, because I want to see what happened to my entity. Uh, with CRUD, you don't have an out-of-the-box history. You can, of course, build your own logging database and uh, just keep track of every change that you made. But it's something that you have to build yourself on top of your application in your database in a separate table. So the event sourcing pattern basically helps on these kind of scenarios. Because you only do inserts, you don't do updates. So you don't have those locking issues, you don't have those concurrence issues. Everyone just sends an event saying, hey, I want to change this on my particular entity. And this is really nice when you have those right heavy workloads. Like I said, we're talking about millions of producers uh, where this is like the ultimate pattern. Of course, you can also use on the lower uh, per throughput, but this is actually where it was made for like this high throughput uh, with many, many producers uh, on there. And this is because inserts are just much more efficient. You can just do an insert, and as long as your uh, database or data store can handle those inserts, you'll be fine. You don't have to think about updating, you don't have to think about locking, you don't have to think about the concurrency. As long as I can do inserts, I can implement event sourcing. And we'll see in a moment why CosmosDB is such a great fit for this. And of course, because you just insert those events, you already have your audit log, because your events are your audit log. Because when you play those back to those events, you can immediately see like what happened to this order, who changed something, who updated the, the current state, and that's all just out of the box with event sourcing. So this is why I like event sourcing a lot for these kind of scenarios. You mentioned for the CRUD uh, we, that it's not easily scalable. Yes. So how easy it is it scaled to? Uh, yeah, so event sourcing is much easier scalable because, like I said, as long as you can handle those inserts, and of course you have to get a data store that actually can handle those millions of inserts at the same time. Um, but as long as you can handle this, then you will be okay. So um, because you don't have to think about that locking issue and stuff like that anymore, you just have to handle inserts. Um, and just in a moment, we're going to talk about like how Cosmos DB does this and why this is so amazing for this. But I do think this is also the power of the cloud in general, because the cloud actually allows us to just scale up indefinitely, basically, um, and actually do these kind of things with our, uh, with our applications. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look on event sourcing on Azure. And of course, we are talking about Azure today here, but the same applies basically to any other cloud provider. AWS has similar services. I'm sure Google Cloud has similar services. So if you're not working with Azure yourself, uh, just know like you can probably map this on your own services. We are going to show this on Azure, and of course, Azure is the best cloud, so we should all be using this. <laughs> so event sourcing on Azure. So first of all, Cosmos DB. And Elena is going to talk a bit about this. Yes, yeah, so we're going to use uh, Azure Cosmos DB for those who never uh, worked with this, never met it. It's a globally distributed, massively scalable document-based uh, database. Um, they have different APIs, so as you can see, the, there is a table API, Cassandra, SQL, MongoDB, or Gremlin. By default, if you would start working with Cosmos DB, they're going to be SQL. But uh, why, why it's great for us, um, as, we already saw, as we already said, that uh, we want to have a, an option to in just insert our events without uh, any updates. And uh, Azure Cosmos DB is a schema-less uh, document store, so we will be able just to insert documents. Uh, without basically carrying what about schema, what about version of the document, and so on and so on. So, and it's also um, globally distributed, so multi-regions, they have a, a lot of um, basically um, <laughs> yeah, regions where you can have the data very close to the user, so it's also optimized the performance of, of uh, storing, of writing operation, read operations, uh, and of course, like, uh, there's guarantee for very low latency. Yes. So as you can hear, like Cosmos B is really that kind of data store that you want for an event so sourcing pattern because it can just handle high loads. Um, you it doesn't matter where those events come from. Like you can have in the multiple regions where actually the multiple producers can write to their own regions. And this is really nice for that kind of uh, pattern. 
But of course, we are not going to expose our data store directly to the internet. So our producers will actually talk to something else first. And they're going to send their events into event hubs. And event hubs is a stream-based uh, uh, message store. And so think like Kafka, because I think most people here will have seen Kafka at some point or event hubs itself. But think like I can just push in events and I can then have a stream of events that I can read from. And think of this a bit like a tape deck. So I can go forward in the tape deck, I can go backward in my the tape deck, and same for my stream, so I can just go forward in my stream, backward in my stream. I can say I want to start playing from this point, that can be the beginning, it can be somewhere halfway, it can be specific entry, specific time. So I can basically just go over the stream, and this is actually done by the client. So the client is in control of putting a cursor of, of okay, where do I want to start playing back those events? And this, of course, is very nice if you say, okay, so we had some issues, I want to get the events from the last day again. I can just put that cursor back and it just will start playing again. Or if I introduce a new client, they will just get the complete stream, they can start from the beginning and just play back all those events. And once again, this is also very uh, optimized for high throughput. Uh, event hubs can also handle millions of events per second. So it's really, once again, a great partner in our event sourcing pattern. Yeah, and of course, uh, Azure Functions. Um, thanks for the built-in triggers with, uh, for Azure Functions, for the Event Hub, for Cosmos DB. It will be super easy to implement uh, basically functionality, how we want to write our data in Cosmos DB, how we want to also react on those changes. And also because it's serverless, uh, very, very nice that we don't need to pay basically for, uh, for, the, mm, for having Azure Functions. We pay only when we use them. And uh, of course, it also will help us to concentrate only on our business logic, uh, combining triggers and bindings. We can avoid like a huge amount of code. We can just add how we want to actually uh, aggregate our data, how we want to aggregate our events, and like send, save it back to Cosmos DB or any other data store. Exactly. So with these three different services, we are going to implement this, uh, this event sourcing pattern on Azure. And with that, actually, let's have a look how this looks like. So what I'm going to do in this demo, uh, I have a Kafka enabled, uh, I have a Kafka application. And the nice thing about uh, Event Hubs, it actually has a Kafka compatible endpoint. So if you are working with Kafka at, the Kafka at the moment, you can just change your connection string to Event Hubs, and it will actually just send those events into Event Hubs, or on the other side, we retrieve them from, from them without changing any code. So this is very nice that I can just have a Kafka application and go to Event Hubs to have a completely managed platform. Uh, I don't have to host my own Kafka service anymore or anything like that. It's all completely managed for me. It's a pur pure pass service. So I only think about my logic and no longer about infrastructure or anything like that. So that Kafka application is going to push it into Event Hubs. It will be pushed into that stream. And once events are starting to come in, um, we are going to trigger a function on this. So we have an event of binding that sees, hey, there are some e events coming in. I need to start uh, reading the stream. And we'll get those events. And of course, we can apply some logic in here. In this case, we just pass them through dire directly to Cosmos DB. But for example, if I would want some transformations or maybe some validations, this would be the point where I would insert that custom logic, that custom business pr process. In this case, we're just going to push them through into Cosmos DB and store them there as our event store. So let's have a look at what this looks like. So first of all, I have my Kafka producer over here. Um, I'm not going to dive too deeply into the code. Uh, this is not a session about new programming or anything like that. But I will show you some parts of this just to let you know how to do this. If you actually want to have a better look at the code and want to start playing around with this yourself, uh, we have everything on GitHub. We will share the link in the end. So you can have a look at this yourself and actually uh, spin up all the services. All the infrastructure as code is there. All the code for the application is there. So you can actually spin this up yourself. Um, and this is so much. So this is my producer. So this is going to create some events and send them out to my uh, event hubs. And what we are simulating here is that warehouse we were talking about earlier. Um, of course, in real life, this would be many different applications that all will be sending their events. I just have one single application that is going to simulate all those different uh, systems. Um, but what you will see here on this line is that we are just using the Confluent.Kafka library. So this is just normal Kafka um, that you have might already bu have built yourself as well. Um, nothing special, just a Kafka application. And the only thing I had to do to make this work with event hubs is this connection string actually put in the connection string of my event hubs. Everything else is uh, similar, like uh, you can run this against Kafka, it will work to exactly the same as it does against event hubs. No code ch changes needed. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a, some produce, a producer and I'm going to create 1000 different tasks and this will create 1000 different orders and go to different stages of that order. So when I create a processed order, I'm going to create some random orders with some random data in there. Um, I'm going to add some uh, customer info. And so this part over here will be my first event. So this will just be a JSON document that is sent as an event. Now, as you can see, I have a couple different stages that we go through. So order is requested. So someone actually was uh, uh, actually on the website, said, OK, I want this order. It's requested. Um, it will then go to another system, uh, add some more articles, it goes to another system, the ex system accepts it, like, okay, we are going to process this order. So this is another event that we are creating here. Um, as you will see, there's every time the submit and wait, and this just uh, simulates like, okay, we are uh, submitting it, and there will be some time in between those different processes, and that's a random time in between there. So we can update our articles in some cases, we can cancel our order in some cases, most of them will end up in the picking phase, where it's actually in the warehouse being picked, uh, it goes out for delivery, and finally, order gets delivered. So that are different stages that we go through, and as you can see, these are just different events, and these can come from different applications, different systems, where each system just says, hey, I'm doing something to this order. So let's start this one. So it's going to run, it's going to uh, create our orders and send them out to our event hubs, and that will start the function that will see, hey, something is in this event hub, uh, I need to start processing this stream. So it's now creating some data. So uh, there we go, orders are being sent. So while this is running, let's go to the function that's going to trigger from this. And this is my event hub processor function. I already deployed this in Azure, so this is now actually processing the data that's coming in. And while that is doing that, I will run you through the bit code here as well. And Olena already told us that functions have the concept of bindings and triggers. And so the nice thing about binding and triggers is that I don't need to know, for example in this case, how does event ops work? I don't need to know about check marking, I don't need to know about how does this stream work, I don't need to know about the pointer, that's all handled for me. The only thing I do is uh, at this one line over here, so I just say I want an event up trigger, this is my event up that you have to listen on, this is my connection string, and I want back an event data uh, array. And that's all I need to know. So I get an array with events, and I can just start processing them without having to know all about how do I connect to uh, event hubs, how do I do all this kind of logic around this. This is all abstracted away from me. That's very nice because it means that I can st get started very quickly. I don't have a lot much uh, logic that I need to maintain. I can just use this and get those events in. Um, I'm also going to write something out to Cosmos DB, and I'm actually going to use the SDK. And I'm going to do that exactly because what I just said. Those trigger and bindings abstract a lot of things away, which is amazing if you only need the default uh, logic. But if you want to do something more on this, like you want, uh, in this case, I'm going to add some parameters on my uh, Cosmos DB client, this you cannot do with the, those bindings. So if you want a bit more control, you can, of course, still use the SDK, as I will be doing. But I did want to show you how would this look like if I would actually use that binding. So in that case, I would have this Cosmos DB binding. I would say, OK, this is my collection, my database, my collection, uh, my connection string. And then I would have an output uh, document. And so this is just a document I can then write to. And then put it, as soon as I write to it, it will push it out to my Cosmos DB. Now, like I said, I'm not using something else. I'm using a client uh, over here, the Cosmos, DB, uh, Cosmos client. And that's because I want to have these serialized options, which I cannot do on my binding. Now, if you are like, okay, I need this in many different projects, uh, with many different functions, you can actually write your own custom binding. And then, of course, on your custom binding, you can actually implement this, and then you once again use a binding. In this case, I just want to show you that you also have still this, all this control, that you can actually just use the SDK for all the different services, and use that to write to this. So I'm going to create my database if it doesn't exist. I'm going to create my containers. And then I'm going to look the, through those events that are coming in. So this uh, are all the, just an array of events that I'm going to run through and going to store into Cosmos DB. Um, like I said, I'm not doing much special here. I'm just going to get that event and store it as the JSON document that comes in. But of course, I can do a lot of custom logic here, like uh, validations, mappings, transformations, whatever you want. In this case, I just get my message body. Uh, I convert it to an order object. I make sure that I remove all the null values and stuff like that because I'm using the same order object for all my different events. 
Um, so I want to skip, uh, like we move all the null values and empty fields and stuff like that. Of course, you can also use different events. Like Olena said, it's a schemaless uh, data store. So I can also have different kinds of events. Uh, CosmoDB doesn't really care about this. As long as there's some data in there, it will work. And then I'm going to just push this into my Cosmos DB. Uh, I'm using Upsert, but of course, like I said, we don't do updates. We just use inserts in, in this case. Um, so I'm just inserting that event into our Cosmos DB, and it will then be there to handle. Now, if I go over, over here, so I have my Azure environment here. Um, here we see that I have an event up uh, over here with one event up in this. So my orders, you already see there's some throughput coming through here. Um, and this is just the orders event hub that I'm pushing these messages into. So nothing too, too special to see here. It's just a stream of data that I'm pushing into, and then we can start processing this. I have my function app over here, with, which I just showed you. That's running the function uh, that I uh, showed, which will push the data to CosmosDB. So the more interesting one is actually this one, uh, our CosmosDB itself. Because this is where those events are being stored, and this is where we can start querying them, start pro processing them and actually start working with them. So if I go over here in my items, uh, I will see that I have a lot of different items over here already. Uh, so I, I'm using about 1,000 different orders with each of them about five different events. So you can ima imagine that this will be a long list. So I'm not going to uh, go to, to all of them. But just show you how this looks like. It's just that the JSON document that I got for my, uh, that was produced in my Kafka producer, sent to my event hubs, and then stored into Cosmos DB. I can see there's some uh, information about the customer in here, some articles. And what I want to show you, uh, so I already prepared one order beforehand, because I can now just say uh, I want to filter on this specific uh, order number. And now I see for this specific order number, I have some different events. So this is my event sourcing pattern that you see here. Because I have an event that was created or requested, I have another event that looks completely different that it was accepted. So this came from another system. I have another event that is picking, so this came from our picking uh, systems, uh, an event that's out for delivery, and finally, an event that was delivered. And so now my clients can actually just play back those five events, and they will see, okay, so I have an order with this order number for this customer, this were the articles, it was uh, accepted at this moment, it was uh, picking at this moment, it went out for delivery at this moment, it was delivered at this moment. And so by playing back those five events, they can have a complete state of this specific order. So that's the event sourcing pattern implemented on top of our Azure services. And next up, we are actually going to see, um, so we now have those events in our data store. And now we're going to see how we can create those materialized views. And Olena is going to tell all about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, basically my part is will be about reading all those events. So we already wrote them a uh, massive amount of data in, in Cosmos DB. Now we have to extract somehow this data because we're not going to, uh, to query uh, all these events and aggregate it in a re real time uh, because this is would not be just efficient. Uh, in a, with a relational database, for example, that might work. We will have just query, we will run it a anytime we want, and uh, then we will have aggregated view or whatever. For Cosmos DB, that's not that's not the case because uh, I mean it will just end up in a in a, uh, that our Cosmos DB will be super expensive uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it's not uh, because of the partitioning in Cosmos DB. Um, if we will just write a query and we'll try to extract all this data in a, in a, in a, in a uh, real time, uh, we will just end up querying, having a cross partition queries. And this is very expensive, so uh, to avoid that kind of uh, operations, we um, will be Creating, we will create pre-populated views, so we will save those queries, result of those queries, uh, we will save them in the Cosmos DB, and uh, this will basically uh, be for optimization of read operations. And uh, any time when there is update will happen, update in our case will be adding a new document, but for Cosmos DB, it, uh, any change, it, uh, if you update the document, if you insert a new document, uh, we have an option to react on those changes. And to react on those changes, we have a Cosmos DB change feed. Basically, uh, the complete log of all the changes which are happening in our container. Um, in all the container, for every container, there is a separate change feed. 
And um, we can interact with the change feed uh, in three different ways. So as you can see, when application writes some data in Cosmos DB, a change feed stores all this, uh, all this information, and we can pull this data uh, from a change feed and create different projections. So when we are pulling the data from a change feed, uh, it's, this is the most complicated way to interact with this because we have to take care of uh, which partition we're going to, um, to use. We have to handle all the exceptions, we have to deploy it, we have to manage and scale, and everything is basically on us. Um, the use case, which would be great if we, for example, decided that we want to transfer all our data in a different data store, and then we can use this pool model. Uh, we pull all the data, all the events from the very beginning, transfer them in a different data store, and we are done. Uh, the second option how to interact with change feed is could be implementing change feed processor library. Uh, using this library, we can, it's basically SDK uh, on top of a change feed where the pool operation is done for us already. So we, s we provide the container name and then the database with the connection string uh, that we want to listen. And anytime when there's a change happening, all those events are going to be pushed to us. And then we can process in, in any way we want. Uh, we still have to deploy it, we still have to take care of a couple of things, but this is a much easier way to interact with the change feed. And the last one uh, that we will use is the Azure functions with the trigger. So we will use uh, Cosmos DB trigger and Cosmos DB bindings. Uh, when there is a change going to happen, uh, something will be added or updated in Cosmos DB, those events will be pushed to us, but this is uh, much easier than the previous uh, two ways because we just have to publish it on Asia and Asia is going to take care of, um, of everything for us. So basically that's the idea. We're going to consume those events uh, and aggregate them and create and pre-save and pre those materialized views, basically projections. So before you go ahead, like you're saying, like we are going to uh, recreate them and we are going to, basically you're saying we are going to duplicate our data for different kind of types of views. Now, um, when I was in school, and it was very long ago, but if I think many people here will remember this, like when I was in school, I was always taught like you never duplicate data, you normalize data. Um, so here you're saying now, and we are going to uh, actually uh, duplicate our data. So what changed and why do we do this this way instead of normalizing? Basically, as I already said, it's the, the way how uh, Azure Cosmos DB works, because they use partitioning, um, they um, basically... I the okay, so <laughs> why, we, wh why we have to duplicate our data? Because um, uh, we provide the partition key when we store our data. And uh, for the Cosmos DB, it means that uh, they have different physical servers, it calls um, physical partitions, where they store our data. And they guarantee for us that data which is aggregated in the same logical group, which is logical partition, will be always stored in the same physical server. However, it doesn't mean that the whole database which that we have is going to be stored in the same place. So when we, uh, if you have like really massive amount of data, our data might be distributed between the diff different physical servers. servers. And um, in this way, if we will start querying this data, we will just end up like um, hitting different logical partitions and different physical partitions. And this will end up in a really significant cost. So for us, it will be a much better way to aggregate this data and duplicate it because the cost for, s for storing data is like 50 cents or something per gigabyte. Um, and cost for request units is much more, <laughs> much more expensive. So. Uh, Duplicating this data um, as much as we want, like the same amount of data can be represented in different projections, can be pre-saved for different clients, and this will be this will be much cheaper than if you will try to calculate it in real time. Thank you. And <coughs> now we will go to a demo part. So we um, after we wrote all the data in Cosmos DB, we will have also Azure Azure function with uh, uh, Cosmos DB trigger. We will react on those changes and we will create two different materialized views, uh, two different projections, and we will save them back in Cosmos DB. And of course, they will be available for our clients. And first of all, I will go to the. Oops. Yep. Mm, yep. Yeah, so. Here we can see 
uh, that we're going to have a warehouse view trigger and customer view trigger. So basically, it's two different Azure, Azure functions. Um, in a, uh, this is example of uh, having one fun function up and two different uh, Azure functions for our case. Uh, normally, like if, if, if we would implement it in real time, we would even have two different functions up for two different um, functions because then it, in this way it's easy, easier to scale and they will be absolutely independently. Just for us, for demo purpose, we decided to keep it in one function up, so we do need to um, deploy additionally the uh, second one. And in this case, what we have, as I mentioned already, we have to specify the container and the database and also the connection string to our Cosmos DB. And we use in the list collection name, it's a order list co container. It's just to handle the state between Azure functions of change feed. And um, this prefix, uh, I'm because I'm using two different uh, functions for creating uh, my projections, but I don't want to create two different list containers. I want to share those resources. I can provide this prefix, and this means that the same container will be used, but they will share basically they will share resources, and they will use like uh, this warehouse trigger will use the uh, resources for the warehouse group, and uh, the customer view trigger will use resources for the customer group, but the same container, basically. And <coughs> in this case, we have a Cosmos DB trigger, and we also using Cosmos DB binding. So uh, this binding is uh, will provide me a functionality of Cosmos client. So I'm not going to connect to a specific collection to pull data or, or write data when my Azure function will finish execution. I want to get the whole Cosmos client because I want to read some data, I want to validate it, I want to create projection, uh, projection for, my, uh, for my events, and I want to save it back in Cosmos. So this is a bit more complex operation, but normally if you would want to just return some data uh, from Azure function, you can use, for example, uh, input binding on the start of the the Azure function, uh, pull the data from the container, and then return it back to the client if you want. So here I'm pr cr creating the warehouse service. It's just uh, to have some uh, business logic for handling the events. Oop. And I'm just, uh, I will just iterate uh, through the documents here on these lines. I will deserialize my, my document back to the object order, and I will call on, a, on my service um, handle warehouse view, which, which it basically will just aggregate all the events. And uh, if I already have projection, it will just update it. If I don't have the projection, it will just create a new one. The same, si the same situation is with uh, customer view trigger. Absolutely the same logic. Uh, I'm just iterating through the documents, again, deserializing and, and handling the information. So if I would show how we can, how we actually handling this. Here is this uh, customer service, for example, I'm using for customer uh, projection. H handle customer view, as I already said, just I'm trying to get the document and see if I already have a projection. If I don't have, I'm creating a new one. If I have, I'm just updating. The, uh, the interesting thing is, is how we actually inter uh, interacting with the Cosmos DB. For example, uh, in, in this case, uh, we have a repository, uh, which is basically our data layer, how we, in, in what way we interact with Cosmos um, DB and our data uh, in the containers. And I'm providing here uh, ID when I want to read the document. I'm providing the here ID, which will be ID of the document and actually partition key. So I know that they're going to be unique. So I'm using the same value for both properties. And in this case, it will be point read operation. So it will cost me one request unit if my document will be uh, less than one kilobyte in, in a size. If I want to, um, if for example my, my document does not exist, I will receive a Cosmos exception. That's uh, that's how it works. You you cannot uh, specify different behavior and for example return null. You have to handle it on your own. Um, provide the custom logic for creation and update of document. Um, it's very similar. The only difference is here I'm replacing my my projection and here I'm creating a new one. 
Uh, we can also say that enable content response on write equal to false. It means that it's a bit of optimization. It means that I would not receive newly created or updated object. And in this case, I'm also providing partition key explicitly. That's also for, for kind of a micro optimization. Uh, if you would not do this, it's also fine because SDK will extract it under the hood on its own. And let's go to a portal. And you already saw that uh, we have here two additional containers. I hope it's, yeah. Yep. So while Eldred was running his part of the demo, my Azure functions were already published on Azure. Um, so they were already reacting on the changes in the order container. So here we have hub monitoring and customer overviews. And if you'll have a look on the items, yep, we have some information. As I mentioned already, for ID of the document and the partition key, uh, pro, um, uh, partition key property, I'm using the same value. For the uh, warehouse overview, I'm using warehouse ID and just today's date. It means that I will be able to easily get the document for today and see how many orders were created in my warehouse for today. And this is going to be a situation for every warehouse, for every day of, of uh, how our business is up and running, basically. As we can see here, uh, I don't really have much information. I just have a count, uh, how many orders, and order numbers. Uh, that might be helpful for uh, finding, for example, in which warehouse our order was placed, or how many orders in general were placed in this warehouse, for maybe some dashboards. If someone ever was in the warehouses, uh, there is always some displays, how many orders are incoming, how many um, uh, yeah, how many orders were fulfilled, and this is basically will allow us to have a point read, so this operation will be super cheap, and any time uh, it will be available. We don't need to calculate anything in uh, real time. The same for the customer. Oh. Yep. Again, we are using customer ID and ID. So customer ID property is our partition key um, pass, and ID of the document is the same values. And it's again will give us a point read operation, super cheap. In this case, uh, document is a bit bigger, but I still, I guess it's not more than one kilobyte, but it might be a good idea to divide this document, for example, for some other needs. But in my case, I want to be able to show for my customer somewhere on the web page or maybe on the phone, the overview of the orders and the, the articles he, he or she ordered. So we have all the orders for the specific customer, 16, the count of those orders, and the, uh, a bit of information. So if you have any articles, what was the status, what, what is the order number? Basically, the only information we need, and it's all available in one document and easily accessible. So let's go back to the presentation. As we already saw, it's super easy. Yep. <laughs> As we already saw, it's super easy to uh, basically react on the changes in Co Cosmos DB, react on uh, on those events, uh, aggregate them, and write them back in Cosmos DB. So in our case, we just created easily two projections um, without massive amount of code. We just used Azure functions with those, all those uh, triggers and bindings, a bit of uh, business logic, and we are ready to go. We are ready to expose our data for the clients. So we going to uh, to the end of our session and uh, to a bit of su uh, summarizing and finalizing a couple of key takeaways. So we already saw that Cosmos DB could be a great um, central append-only persistent data store. We can easily insert all the uh, all the documents, all the events that which are happening with our data, and afterwards we can operate and consume those events in in the way as we want. Yeah, and so when you are running into these like scenarios where you need a like right heavy workloads, do have a look at this pattern because, like I said, this pattern is really optimized for that. It's not only usable for that, but it's definitely optimized for those kind of uh, patterns where those kind of scenarios where you have millions of producers, just a lot of events coming in, and that you just want to be able to replay uh, those events to actually get to your store, to, to your object. 
Um, as we have seen, like on Azure, it's actually quite easy to implement this. It's all past services that we used. So everything is managed for you. Uh, you don't have to think about infrastructure, anything like that. Uh, it's, it's all very uh, easily usable. And especially, especially when you start using those bindings, for example, in functions, you really can just focus on your business logic instead of having to focus on all the things around it. And what we see in practice, like I've been working with many different clients that use these uh, services. Olena has been working with different projects on this. Uh, it just makes things much faster, much easier. Um, and so actually are you just creating value for the business instead of spending money for them. <laughs> you like spending money <laughs> for the business? <laughs> uh, so it's easy to prepare materialized views for various consumers. Uh, so, a couple of benefits from this, uh, like f f event sourcing in general. First of all, we have the same uh, set of data. We have single source of truth. We have all the events, and we generate all our projections based on the same amount of data. This also could be great for the smoke testing, for example, if you want to replay our events again from the specific point of time or maybe from very beginning. We can easily do this with a change feed. We can just uh, connect to a change feed, replay it, and see what happened and at what. Uh, period of time uh, the, the problem happened. So, and also when we adding, for example, new consumers, the new clients, uh, it's easy for us to uh, prepare the prepare these projections, prepare those materialized views. Again, we can just connect to a change feed, pull the data, and be ready to go with the new clients. Yes. And so finally, uh, have a look at the Azure ecosystem if you want to, uh, like I said, uh, focus more on value and less on spending money. Uh, we showed you three services today, um, but of course there's um, at the moment like I think 250 plus ish services out there, and I always see like a, a, a box of Lego. Like there's many different pieces, and you can pull, put them all together and start building your own solutions by using those services that make sense for your scenarios. So um, the services we said to show you today are definitely very amazing services, but there's many more other very nice services out there that you could use for this. So once you start looking in your own scenarios, definitely have a look at all those different services, start mapping them. Uh, uh, Microsoft already has some help for you on this. Like there's some websites and some overviews like, okay, if you want to IoT, these are the services that you need to look into. Uh, stream processing, there's these services. But have a look at those services, have a look at your scenario and start mapping those services on your scenario um, so that you actually create the best, uh, 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 the best solution for what you are trying to accomplish. Yeah, and also that um, there is a different services, like for, for us, for me, when I was working in a product company, it was very important to have a real-time aggregation. Basically, when you have warehouse system, you want to be, able to be able at any point of time to say, do we still have this article? Do we, s do we have enough products? And can we really fulfill our orders? And uh, for example, with Cosmos DB, it's possible to have that kind of aggregations, but it would be a bit expensive because we will need to all the time in the real time cal calculate it. And what, what is great with, about Azure ecosystem that they have Apache Spark, for example, uh, can connect in a, uh, under the hood to the uh, Azure Cosmos DB replicas and can have those calculations in real time for us. And it's like, that's a, basically the purpose of, of Apache Spark to do this. So uh, have a look always around the features. Maybe some things are already implemented and ready, ready for us to use. And um, yeah, also it's, uh, they have a free tire. It's a Cosmos DB, it's available for testing. So f before it was the case, like it's too expensive to try, it's too expensive to, to work with this, but now it's not the case. So you can pay as you use and you can also, uh, first months it's uh, free. Yeah, actually the free tier uh, is actually free for as long as you want, uh, up to five gigabytes and I think like 400 oh. request units. Oh. So they actually changed it uh, also like uh, they induce a new uh, the, the tiers. So you have indeed the free tier, which is like uh, you can use as long as you want. If you have small data sets, surplus if you want to pay as you go, or uh, just a normal, so to say, where you actually pay for your consumption uh, and you pay for X amount of your request units. Yeah. So, and at this, thanks a lot for the attention. Uh, here's our details on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Feel free to, uh, um, to contact us if you have any questions or comments. And thanks, Eldad, for, for being an <laughs> amazing co-speaker. Cool it was really a pleasure to be here today and to enjoy the rest of the conference. Yes, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, of course. Uh, thank you for being at the conference. Uh, it's really good to actually be here back in Oslo again. I was here in 2019, and I really missed this last year, so I'm very happy we can do this again. 
Um, yes, so also like I said, the code is there. Go to my, our GitHub, get the code. You can uh, deploy the services. All the infrastructure is code is there. Uh, all the code that you, that we just showed you today is there, so you can use this yourself. So I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, if you did, please leave a green card. <laughs> um, if you did not like the session for whatever reason, let us know as well so we can improve on this. Because uh, like, uh, like I said, we can always be better. We can always improve. So let, uh, let us know. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. And we still have some time for questions. So if there are any questions, let us know. And otherwise, we can do them afterwards as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the question, can I replay the event, uh, the uh, change feed, uh, when I add a new projection or anything like that? Like, is it like also an event store sourcing pattern? And Olena can <laughs> tell Yeah, yeah. About so um, <coughs> basically, uh, that's why we, <coughs> we were implementing event sourcing with Cosmos DB, because it was quite interesting case, the change feed is already event sourcing on its own. So every time you add data, it doesn't matter if you implement event sourcing and you just append the documents, or you decided that you will update your documents every time, the change feed is event sourcing and it's always stores the whole history. So even if you created a projection and you were updating them over and over again, the change feed will store all the events, So for even for your projection. So you can easily replay <coughs> with original data or with those projections anytime you want. So. Yep. Uh, how is consistency ha handled when you have multiple events on the same uh, data source? There's, there's like five levels of consistency uh, with, <coughs> with Cosmos DB and uh, basically it depends on, on your use case, but there is like from the strong consistency to eventual uh, with the session and to in between. <laughs> yep. uh, but yeah, five different levels and um, it all depends on the use case. If you really need like super, super consistent data, then strong consistency and they have a quorum basically for replicas. They're going to replicate uh, one, one of the replicas will replicate to a different region and yeah, you, we will have no problems with this. So question over here. Yep. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what is the about? Uh, do I have cost difference? Like, if we are using this, like with old style with SQL and things like that, versus if we are using like these kind of services with event sourcing and Cosmos DB. Um, like, I'm an architect, so it always depends. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so definitely, what you have to look into when you start actually modeling your uh, your solution, have to look into those costs. And Cosmos DB actually has a very nice co cost calculator. Where you can get like you could create a message like okay this is about how my message looks like um, this is how many um, times per day I expect this to uh, have to insert this how to, uh, many times to read this and you will, for CosmoDB will get like a nice OV okay this is how much we uh, expect you to spend about um, so of course uh, materialized views that Olena showed you today is one of the ways you can actually get that cost down because instead of every time reading that whole co collection you're just getting okay this is actually the view I want this is the information I want and so this is one of those ways that you can actually get the, get the cost down so there's not a, like a single answer I can give you like okay uh, Cosmos B is more expensive or less expensive than SQL because it really depends on how do you model your solution uh, I do think it's very important that when you start looking at this, and maybe if you come from a background where you were using SQL, actually do go in, like have a, uh, do read about the different services, uh, understand how they work, and then actually build the optimal solution with this. Because if you just go, okay, um, I'm going for SQL, I will just now make this into documents, store it in our Cosmos B, and then just using my same queries and stuff like that, it will definitely be more expensive. So that's why it's so important to actually understand how is the, what these services work, um, and how we can actually implement those best uh, the solution in the best way. Cool. <laughs> so I, no, oh, a couple over here. Um, yeah, so that's a question about the technologies under Cosmos DB. So you have SQL, Mongo, Cassandra, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, APIs. Uh, basically, you can use. So, so if you have an on-premise Cassandra data store today, could you then <coughs> easily migrate that to use? The idea is that you should should be able to do this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, there there is um, 
they have they provide those five different APIs, and they they say that you should be able to easily exactly for this purpose. If you have on premise, then you can easily migrate to cloud, and that should that's how it should work. But of course, I heard that there was a couple of situations when you actually start doing this, there might be some complications, but nothing that cannot be solved. So yes, that's that's how it should work, and that's how. But don't expect that it will be like. Yeah. <laughs> so also one addition on that, uh, do have a look at the documentation of Microsoft because they actually explain like what are the, uh, how far they are compatible with which versions of the APIs and what are like the issues you might run into. But if it's the case and you really want to migrate from on-premise to, uh, to cloud and with the Cosmos DB and so on, they also support. They, yeah. they will provide the support, they will provide a like, kind of consultation, like, do you really need to do this? Maybe you not change your mind. But I'm pretty sure that uh, it uh, should be yeah. quite easy. So... Yeah, also about the generation of the projections. Are there any delays if there are very high volumes of events um, There will be a delay uh, because, basically, to generate the projection, uh, you have so you have one Azure function, this write data, and then change feed like which is reacting on this, and you have another another Azure function which is uh, generating projection and again writing in in Cosmos DB, and then you will have probably another Azure function which will basically react on those projections and will populate it to to the clients, for example. You can also have Azure function uh, with uh, like uh, SignalR, for example. Uh, but it's still like three layers, basically. And of course, there will be <coughs> delay. There, there might be delay for warm up of the function if it's just started, the, like, you know, a morning, like some orders started to come, and then th there's going to be a delay. But uh, it depends, of course, on the, like, I guess, pricing tier, like, the, what's yeah. the plan? So might be significant, might be not. It all depends on how, how, how you want to actually implement it. But it's definitely like, milliseconds, might be. Yeah, so indeed, uh, if you have something that's like very low, should fa be very low latency, uh, Cosm V itself provi provides, I think, like 99 percentile will be under 10 milliseconds. Uh, for functions, you would probably want to go to the premium plan because then you actually get like the pre warmed functions. Uh, so you don't have that warm up, uh, the delay of about like a second or something like whatever it is these days. Um, but yeah, so if you really look into that, like, do have a look at like the more premium tiers because they actually have some solutions for this. And in that case, I would expect also it would make sense. Uh, first in the back. <laughs> um, you mentioned that um, one problem with prod um, is that you actually can get deadlocked um, yep. by updating. But if you aggregate the views and store these aggregated views, don't you have to say um, so yeah, you can. Uh, well, once again, this is really about how you also, uh, because we, we just showed you today, okay, how do we actually do event sourcing? There are some other f things that you need to do before this. For example, event storming. We actually are looking at into these kind of things like, okay, where can our events come from? Uh, can they be like uh, simultaneous and things like that? So you can still walk into this, but uh, if you think about this beforehand, it is easier to solve this than with CRUD. Let's put um, it that way. There is also another thing is, uh, for example, when you do aggregate the events for the projections, the first thing is that uh, you can have a batch of events. You can receive like bulk basically of the events. And it's already like when you need to, to do an update of thousand times or you receive those thousand events and you do update once. So that's one thing which can make it really, really less possible. And if there is a problem, and if there is a really happening that there is a, I never met that kind of situation, but it could be, there is a conflict resolution in Cosmos DB. They can have, you can either uh, provide the specific rules how to, pro how to solve that kind of issues, or you can manually solve them. So, but it's like, really, you have to create this case. Mm. <laughs> yep. Uh, what kind of API do you actually use in your samples? SQL. The yeah, default one, yeah. But you use like uh, MongoDB and Cosmos? Uh, no, no, SK, uh, the, the default one. So you have uh, Cosmos DB and you have different APIs. The MongoDB, Cassandra, Table, and SQL. Okay, and, and, and Gremlin. Okay, and, and change streams, uh, they work for SQL API also? Change streams? Change it. I change it. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. But basically, um, I mean, yeah, SQL API, but it's document store, it's schemaless. So you can operate, you can, um, it's basically to make it more comfortable for people from the like uh, SQL world. Uh, you can provide SQL queries, you can write it, but it's not recommended way. So recommended way is basically like CQRS. 
uh, as, as we were doing, we, write, we wrote the data, we wrote the events, and then we uh, separated read and write operations, uh, created materialized views, those projections, and that's how we read it, but not like querying uh, in real time and stuff, stuff like this. So it's a last question, and if I miss you, I try to look around, but if I did miss you, just come up to stage, or mm -hmm. we can talk outside, so. So, so if, you if you need a really high consistency in Chrome and everything, it would be better just to use SQL instead of Cosmos. Uh, could be, could be. I mean, uh, what's the use case? Uh, of course, it's if you, it's, uh, yeah, the couple of questions, uh, times I had this question, like, when would you use Cosmos DB? Um, of course, I would not be like, uh, every time, uh, let's use Cosmos just because. Uh, there is a use case when you really don't need because it will be overhead, for example. But if I do have the, the kind of um, use cases that I have my data, high volume data, high write operation, and I need to represent my data for read operations in many different projects, many different views. For me, Cosmos would be a logical, like, good way to go. But it's actually, it's not just because of um, Cosmos DB. It's more like event sourcing and secure us. Yeah. Uh, but um, if you don't really need that kind of functionality, it might be really just be too, too com complicated and normal database is also fine. And of course, like once again, architect. So it really depends <laughs> on your scenario. Um, so if you have like relational data that's uh, like very relational and like that kind of data, yeah, then just put it into SQL. If you are working like with documents or like graphs or stuff like that, like that's where Cosmos DB really shines. And so, as always, it really depends on your scenarios. They have uh, they have described scenarios in documentation, if I remember. They like really have a couple the couple of scenarios when they say, okay, this is really would be good good fit. The rest you can think for yourself. So. I would say it will be nice to check it there on documentation. So with that, uh, let's close session. Like I said, if you have any questions, just come up to us. We can talk here, we can talk outside, wherever. Um, I hope you enjoyed the sessions, uh, session. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the sessions. Enjoy the conference. Olena, thank you. And thank you for everyone for being here. Thank you.